This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. At our Military History Night of November the 3rd, attended by the Consul General of the Netherlands, Harmony Dema, Canadian historian and writer Ted Barris spoke on the liberation of the Netherlands in World War II and his latest book release, Days of Victory. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our CMI Military History Night. My name is Patricia Hind White, organizer of this event. <clears throat> Wednesday, November the 3rd, 2021. This presentation, which is a combination of live attendance and Zoom platform will be videotaped for educational purposes. Now tonight, we are indeed honored to have in our live audience, the new Dutch consul to Canada, Mr. Herman de Dima. And although I'm not there to greet you in person, a very, very well welcome, well, warm welcome to our CMI and Canada. Welcome, sir. There will be a question and answer period following the speaker's presentation. And for our Zoom audience, ask that you mute your mics and hold your uh, questions till that time and also turn off your camera. Presenter, Ted Barris. Topic tonight, Days of Victory, the Liberation of the Netherlands, World War II. Ted's talk this evening offers accounts of Canadian participation in the liberation of Holland, Operation Market Garden, and the shelled Escure, taking the German surrender at Wiegendingen, the Operation Manor food drops in the hunger winter of 1945. A personal story here. I remember an RCMI member, a Dutch gentleman, telling me that as a young lad in Holland, racing to pick up one of the bundles, only to find to his great disappointment that all it contained was a huge box of pepper. <laughs> anyway, recently retired after 18 years of full-time teaching, journalism at uh, Centennial College. Our speaker is an award-winning author and broadcaster he, uh, presenting regularly at RCMI. His writings appear regularly in national press and magazines as diverse as Air Force, Esprit de Corps, and Zuma. He has also worked as host, contributor for most CBC radio network programs and TV Ontario. He is the author of 19 best-selling non-fiction books, including a series on wartime Canada. In, um, and in 19, 2018, his 18th book, Dam Busters, Canadian Airmen and the Secret Raid Against Nazi Germany, and for which the RCAF awarded Ted and Dumb Busters its 2018 NORAD Trophy for unequaled contribution to the preservation of Air Force values, traditions, heritage, and history. Ted's book, Days of Victory, just released in paperback, is available for purchase and autographing at this event. And that being said, and without further ado, over to you, uh, Ted. A warm welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Pat, and welcome, everyone. Uh, I can say that uh, to the physical audience in front of me. It's I, I have just only recently been able to see the faces live and in the flesh again since the pandemic shut down all public appearances. Um, in fact, I think I did an appearance on the day before the nationwide lockdown, sometime in the middle of the month of March uh, and 2020, and I haven't spoken again in public to an audience that's literally in front of me until re very recently. So this is a real pleasure. It's an honor. And those of you who are joining us on Zoom, well, it's old hat <laughs> because you're used to this sort of thing. We all have become used to it. Um, one thing I'll say in sort of preface uh, for the Zoom audience, um, I have a number of video clips as part of my presentation, and uh, they will seem a little jerky uh, because of the transmission through the Zoom system. Don't be alarmed. Uh, the essence of them is there. The audio will be there, and I'll try to couch each one in a way that uh, 
uh, even if it stalls and stutters a little bit, you'll know pretty much what's going on. So this is a, a real treat for me to be back in front of an audience, to be at the RCMI, to be able to talk. Um, this presentation uh, I created a year and a half ago, and it was uh, intended to be taken hither, thither, and yon across the country last year as the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands occurred. Uh, I was even going to do the talk and lead a tour through the Netherlands last May, uh, May of 2020. Um, but all that was in the, uh, the garbage because of the need for us all to remain apart, locked down at home, alone, <laughs> and just reading lots of books. So in the time that um, I couldn't public speak, I wrote another book. And that's for another visit. Let me just also say that one of th those of you who have attended my talks here at the RCMI or elsewhere will know that I pay special attention to stories that reflect Canadian service in wartime, um, where others have overlooked us. Um, it's, it, for me, it's a, a vital component of the work that I do. And the work that I do is very much dependent on interviews I have done over 50 years of writing and broadcasting, teaching journalism and writing history um, with somewhere between six and 7,000 veterans. I've had the gift of their memories, which fuels the fire of my ability to write these books. This book, Days of Victory, actually uh, the first draft was written, co-written with my father, Alex Barris, whose name some of you will remember either because he was a journalist you read in the newspaper, remember the old pink telegram in Toronto? Or if you have a very old television set, he was on Front Page Challenge <laughs> and One of a Kind and all those shows. My dad and I did the first edition of Days of Victory in 1995 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the end of the war. But because of the growing fascination that the Dutch had about Canadian participation in their liberation and vice versa, our sense of ourselves I sense that the area of the end of the war, the victory at the end of the war, uh, deserved another look. And in fact, the, the picture that's on the front, that image, the photograph of the woman with her hands thrown in the air, was taken on the 5th of May, 1945, which for the Dutch was VE Day. That's when their country was liberated. And um, this photograph, for me, captures the essence of what liberation meant. There is such energy in that photograph, such delight, such a thrill, such relief that it had to be on the cover. And uh, so as I gathered between 1995, when the first edition of the book I co-authored with my dad came out and 2005, when I revisited it, much more became clear about the Dutch liberation that needed attention and I stitched it into a new, virtually a brand new book, which is what this is. And it's just now out in paperback. Um, I think it's fair. There's the actual shot there. Look at her face. I mean, can you, can you imagine what that must have felt like? And I know that um, uh, with the Consul General here tonight and others in our audience with Dutch heritage, the stories of that feeling have been passed down uh, through two generations. And... Um, its exhilaration cannot be understood unless you were really there. There are many stories associated with the liberation of the Netherlands. Almost all of them have a Canadian connection. Perhaps the one that you might not think off the bat as having a Canadian connection is, of course, the very famous sort of turning point in the war. Some refer to Operation Market Garden as a failure. Some claim it's a total success. Somewhere in between, I think, is the truth. And indeed, this was the operation which would have the Allies leapfrog across the front lines, which were then sort of along the Belgian border um, with the Allies to the south, the Germans to the north, into Holland and shorten the war in Montgomery's view. I'm not here to evaluate that at all. My role is here to share some of the stories that have a Canadian angle. Here's a clip from the movie in which Edward Fox outlines the objective. <laughs> 
Gentlemen, this is a story that you will tell your grandchildren, and mightily bored they'll be. <laughs> the plan is called Operation Market Garden. Market is the airborne element, and garden the ground forces. That's us. Now, this is our position on the Belgian border here. Tomorrow, three airborne divisions will begin landing in Holland. 35,000 men taking off from 24 airfields in troop-carrying planes or towed in gliders. The American 101st, here, around Eindhoven. The American 82nd, here, south of Nijmegen. And our own first airborne boys and a Polish brigade here at Arnim. 64 miles behind enemy lines. The plan is to reach Eindhoven in two to three hours and Arnhem in two to three days. That, gentlemen, is the prize. The bridge over the Rhine. The last bridge between us and Germany. Kickoff will be at 14.35 hours tomorrow afternoon. Now imagine the extraordinary feat to recreate this 35,000 paratroops in the motion picture. That alone deserves a tremendous acknowledgement. And this scene goes there, all this fabulous footage shot for the, the motion picture, The Bridge Too Far. But let me just share with you something that most people who know this subject well, who watched the movie, reveled in the extraordinary, the cameos of everybody in Hollywood who was anybody appearing in the movie. Something that maybe not too many people recognize. While Market Garden was an Anglo-American operation in name, in fact, Canadians participated. Early in 1944, a young Lieutenant from Temiskaming, Quebec, Charles Scott Brown, many of us here at the ICMI knew very well. Yes, raise your glass, Eric, and toast him. Absolutely. May he rest in peace. Charles Scott Brown had joined a contingent of 673 Canadian infantry officers on loan to the British Army. The volunteer force, code name, not surprisingly, Can Loan, reinforced scores of British regiments in the lead up to the invasion of Northwestern Europe. Just 21 but with a military lineage that went back to his grandfather's service in the Boer War, Scott Brown shipped overseas in the spring of 1944 to become a platoon commander with the 1st Gordon Highlanders, a Scottish regiment with the 51st Highland Division. In other words, he was there, as all the can loans were, to fill the gaps where there had been losses in British and Scottish regiments. So the can loan idea was Canadians were assisting at the officer level. Brown landed in France on D-Day plus six, sustained shrapnel wounds on July the 11th, recuperated and then signed up for the specialized training. There's a shot of Charles Scott Brown then. Um, then he signed up for specialized training. Quote, there was a sign at the old Marleybone Hotel, Scott Brown said, any officers interested in a parachute course, see adjutant. In those days, you got $2 extra pay for danger. So I'd jump out of an airplane with no parachute for $2 a day, he said. <laughs> that was big money, he said. End quote. A month later, he had completed his requisite jumps, getting used to his jumpsuit, uh, carrying gear, a brand gun, a stand gun, his Lee Enfield rifle, eight grenades, and six ban bandoliers of nine millimeter ammunition, uh, perhaps 40 pounds of extra weight. By September the 8th, He'd done 10 training jumps and, quote, showed up at the back door, end quote, of the 1st Battalion of the 1st Parachute Brigade in time for the mid-September Market Garden paratroop drop into Arnhem. In other words, he was going to the northernmost of the three bridges with the British and the Poles. The Canadians were there. Quote, Sunday, the 17th of September, was a gorgeous sunny day, Scott Brown recalled. A beautiful jump. Everything was quiet when we landed just after noon. I had my platoon all together in about eight minutes, and all of a sudden, there were Germans everywhere. 
We started to get shelled. Armored vehicles started to show up all over the place. Then we realized what we were in for. We were 23 kilometers from the Arnhem Bridge, end quote. Scott Brown's platoon and other units of the British 1st and 3rd Parachute Battalions triggered a response from elements of the 9th SS Panzer Division and the SS Training Battalion, which coincidentally were refitting and resting near Arnhem at that moment. The British and the 2nd Parachute Battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel John Frost, met less opposition and reached buildings at the northern end of the Arnhem Bridge. Scott Brown and his platoon managed to advance along the Leopold route into the town of Osterbeek, but remained many miles west of Arnhem and the bridge objective. And because the brigade's radios had been equipped with the wrong crystals, most of which is replicated in the movie, most of the airborne troops fought in a vacuum, not knowing where either friendly or enemy troops were operating. Scott Brown said, it was village fighting, just cat and mouse most of the way. He said, I never did see the bridge. Never. On the 25th of September, about eight days later, when there was an evacuation of those who'd survived that part of Operation Market, of Market Garden, the British airborne position became untenable and its commanders passed along orders to the paratroopers to attempt evacuation back across the river. I'll get to that in a moment. But of all of that mess that he jumped into, Scott Brown said, I guess I had a phobia about being taken prisoner. He decided that he was gonna swim for it. And he did on 25th of September. Of the 673 Canlone officers that Canada dispatched to the British army during the war, nearly three quarters became casualties. 128 died in action, 310 were wounded, 27 became prisoners of war, 22 of them at Arnhem, not Scott Brown. Uh, their military honors included one U.S. Silver Star, one member of the British Empire, four French Croix de Guerre, one Dutch Order of the Bronze Lion, and 41 military cross decorations. And Scott Brown swam for it. We'll get to that story in a few minutes. There he is speaking not so long ago in this very room, talking about the bridge too far, where the Canadians participated. Did you read that in history? Did your history teachers ever tell you that? No. There's an extension of this story, which has another Canadian angle, which most people overlook. This is a map. You see Arnhem on the right-hand side. To the west, the town of Osterbeek. And just to the south of it, see where those pink arrows are? You'll see that the arrows cross a river. Right on the north side of the bank in Osterbeek is the Dutch Reformed Church that you see in the upper left-hand corner, situated about, oh, maybe a kilometer or so from the river, the north side. So now we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15,000 men on the north side and survivors after eight days, numbering somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000, 2,500, deciding to get out. And the way they got out is an interesting story. Again, we'll go, there's the Dutch Reformed Church, in 1944, go back to what it looks like today. In 1944, the evacuation route, that's looking from the church across the river to the south side to safety on the 25th of September, 1944. And here is another clip from the movie in which the operation is described with none other than another cameo appearance from Sean Connery playing Major General Roy Urquhart. Here we go. Thank you. The last two I could find. Charles, we've been given our marching orders. If they discover we're leaving, they'll go all out to destroy us. So we must take every precaution. Now, I've designed this like a collapsing bag. MacDonald here has agreed to man the wireless in order to give the Germans something to listen to. And all the padres and the medical staff have volunteered to stay behind as well. Now, the wounded, who are too bad to move, will replace the men firing. So our defense will seem as before. By the time the Germans find out what's happening, we should all be safely across the river. You'll see here a white tape through the woods. Just like children on a city street, they had the wounded and those who were walking wounded and others following this, this tape down to the river where 
The boats were waiting for them. After taking, taking many casualties coming from the south side of the river to meet the evacuees and to take them out. Operation Berlin, it was called, to get 2,300 and some away from the trouble on the north side of the river. Who did that? The Royal Canadian Engineers. Bet you they didn't teach you that in history class either. And on the south side, as you see in that image, is a small cairn with flags, which Canadians visit and the Dutch visit in honor of the Canadian engineers, saving 2,323 survivors of the Arnhem part of the bridge um, market garden operation. So they crossed that point. One of the major operations that followed this period uh, of the um, Operation Market Garden, once the Allies had reached, in effect, the northern edge of the Belgian territory on the south shore of the Schelte River, or we say Schelt. Did I do that right? Close? Schelte. Um, why was this important? This port, part of the, of the liberation is vital because since June the 6th, 1944, months before, the Allies had been supplying themselves farther north through France and Belgium, all the way from Normandy. Trucks, ammunition, food, men, all coming essentially up the line from the Mulberry Harbor off uh, Gold Beach until they got to Antwerp. When Antwerp was liberated, the opportunity of moving the supply depot for the final push into Germany presented themselves in Antwerp. Problem. While the Allies had the south shoreline of the Scheldt River estuary, they did not have the north shore. This area that you can see just um, from Antwerp extending northwest onto South uh, Babylon and out to Valkyrie Island, all of that was occupied by German forces with tremendous artillery power, Luftwaffe backup, tanks, Tiger tanks, the works. So the objective, the dirty objective of cleaning that out, that North Shore, fell to the Canadians. That one operation through the fall of 1944 and into the early winter required the loss of 5,000 Canadian lives to achieve. The Germans, in anticipation of the Canadians pushing farther west along the islands and along the north shore of the, of the Scheldt, flooded all of that territory with just enough water to reach the top of an average Canadian soldier's boot, which meant that the Canadians, through the fall and into the winter, had nothing to deal with but wet feet constantly and the cold that that created and the misery. You can see a small depiction of that here. One of the climaxes, and there were several key battles that fill our history pages, took place at the causeway in the sort of middle of the picture, just uh, to the left and to the top of the two images that I've superimposed, you can see a small neck of land. That's the causeway. It's a, about a mile long and it linked the area of uh, South Babylon and Valkyrie. All of this is flooded except for the causeway and it must be taken. And so the battle that took place there among the battles of the Scheldt is key. One of the men who participated in that battle is a man whose story I want to review for you, Lieutenant Charlie Forbes, who is with Regiment de Maisonneuve. Here's a little bit of his story again um, which I recounted based on his memoirs and interview material. I begin on November the 1st in this portion of the story, 77 years ago this week. That November night, Lieutenant Forbes led his platoon onto the causeway behind a creeping barrage, friendly artillery fire advancing against the enemy with Canadian troops following each volley. Forbes moved forward 300 yards and found a crater he believed 
was at the vanguard of the Canadian advance. He told his men to take cover to wait for the next barrage sequence. Quote, we were tense as bloody hell, he said. It was pitch dark. The sleet was coming from the north, and I could hear the click, 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 click as the men worked their rifle breeches so that they wouldn't freeze, end quote. As the sky lit up with the next barrage of friendly fire, Forbes saw troops coming towards him and called for his men to open fire. It was then he realized the silhouetted figures were Calgary Highlanders pulling back from a crater just ahead of them. Forbes recalled the thinking that this was war at its ugliest form and immediately leapt at his machine gunners, calling them to cease fire. Forbes himself had been wounded in the wrist. The confusion continued. Through the day, without realizing it, Forbes's platoon advanced past a German position and found itself among German troops on the move. His Mezonov captured seven of them and began questioning the Germans. The man whom he interviewed or interrogated gave his name and rank. Forbes pushed for more information. The German said, I cannot tell you anymore. I do not know anymore, he said. I am 42 years old. I have four children and a wife in Germany. Please, please save me, he said." End quote. By nightfall, a runner suddenly arrived to announce a general withdrawal back across the ground the Mezenov had just covered and seized. Forbes began a, to retrace his steps with only a handful of the 21 men he'd led into the island 12 hours earlier. As they ran past the dikes and back onto the causeway, German shells began falling on the Canadians again. One of Forbes' remaining half dozen men received a shrapnel wound in the back. Quote, Talbot was paralyzed from the waist down, Forbes said. He couldn't walk. So I dragged him into one of the slit trenches on the side of the road. I lifted his battle dress and there was a sharp piece of shrapnel planted at the base of his spine. I pulled it out and he got the feeling back into his legs. He managed to stand up and I put him on my back, end quote. Don't ever try this at home. Charles Forbes, with Talbot on his back, was perhaps the last of the Mezenov to reach the Canadian held end of the causeway. He delivered Talbot to a waiting ambulance. The driver, coincidentally, was Forbes's cousin, Gérard Crote. Most were surprised Forbes had even made it back, and he was immediately put into the care of some Dutch resistance fighters who took him away for first aid treatment. Quote, I had not eaten, Forbes said. I was soaked from being in water all day. I was wounded in the left wrist, I had a fever, and my nerves were shot." End quote. The Dutch attended the young lieutenant. One placed hot water bottles around him, another fed him milk with eggs and Dutch gin. A local doctor gave him medication, but that made him conv convulse and to hallucinate uh, that he was still in the thick of the battle. Eventually, however, he caught up with the regiment on a well-deserved leave in Belgium. The Mezenov had been reduced to less than half their normal strength. And at the end of the liberation campaign, Lieutenant Charlie Forbes was inducted into the Order of Wilhelm, knighted by Queen Wilhelmina herself. That's what the Canadians did along the Scheldt. One of my favorite stories about the liberation of the Netherlands is a story that is probably dominated more in history books and lore by British participation and American participation. Not a surprise, we the Canadians third in line played an important role in this. As you can imagine with the thrust along the line farther uh, up from Market Garden, the German forces were cut in half. This meant that in the largest centers in Holland, the ones to the west of the thrust north, suddenly found themselves with huge populations in the cities. And this created a real problem because the outcome of the war at this point was not in doubt. How it would end was Queen Wilhelmina in London, um, there through, through the war, having fled there, 
announced in broadcast, if catastrophe is to be avoided in the Netherlands, something drastic must be done. What was happening was the Germans to the west of the thrust north of the Allies, the, the, the Dutch in those large centers of Amsterdam, uh, Harlem, Utrecht, uh, Rotterdam. These were all large centers with huge populations. Nobody could get any food and the Germans prevented any movement. If you lived in the country, if the Germans didn't abscond with everything or, or confiscate everything, you had something to survive on, on the land, even as it turned out with the, the beets, the, the, the um, not the beets, the, the tulip bulbs, the tulip bulbs. But in the cities, you couldn't move. And so millions, literally millions were starving. And that's what she's talking about in terms of catastrophe. Well, the Canadians participated in this in a rather unique way. No, not rather unique, unique. <laughs> They participated in, they, they uh, sparked a meeting at a place called Ochtevelt at a schoolhouse. And at this location, in late April 1945, a Canadian army car brings German officers west of the Allied thrust for a special meeting. They're blindfolded. They're not going to be harmed, but they're brought to this meeting to discuss bringing food into those cities, allowing aircraft to deliver food, to drop it into those cities unharmed by German guns in that sector. Here's a bit of a newsreel clip giving you some uh, insight as to and a vision of what this looked like. To help meet the desperate needs of the Dutch starving in isolated cities, food supplies from the United Nations are rushed to Holland by air. At an airfield in England, food is being loaded into Allied bombers that only the week before were battering Germany into submission. Over the desolate, flooded fields of Holland, once before the Germans touched them, among the most fertile in Europe, over the broken bridges, the broken towns, across a land ravaged by the German retreat, fly the bombers. Pilot flares mark the target areas, and the Mercy cargo descends. In three days, over 800 tons of food for a stricken people. In order for this to work, the aircraft had to fly at low altitude. You can't drop boxes of food from thousands of feet. In effect, you had to drop it at hundreds of feet. In fact, one of the um, Dutch families whom I interviewed about this food drop, they were in Rotterdam at the time, said the aircraft were flying so low, they blew off the tops of haystacks in the farm fields. Now that's even lower than 100 feet. That's lower than the dam busters flew into Germany to the Ruhr. The point being that they had to drop the boxes so they stayed intact, the bags of, of food and so on. Operation Mana was the operation um, that the British and the Canadians flew on. And Operation Chowhound was the American flying fortresses. But look at the amount of food they dropped. 6,680 tons of food in Mana and then 4,000 tons from Chowhound. And then the food is distributed. But what was a remarkable for me was the excitement that this precipitated. I mean, we're just weeks from the end of the war in April 45, but the people who experienced this drop, it changed them. This is a crew whom I interviewed about 25, 30 years ago. A friend of mine was doing a documentary at, um, the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Hamilton. And these members of this, this crew were together for a totally different film shoot. They were doing a thing about, I think the series was called Bomber Boys. You may remember it on television. In any case, they were interviewing members of this crew. And I found out that they were in Hamilton. And I, the fellow who was producing and directing the documentary allowed me to steal these guys away for an evening. I bought them dinner, went back to their motel rooms, bought some scotch and <laughs> rye, plied them a little bit with the booze, and they started to tell these remarkable stories of getting in to Amsterdam, Rotterdam. Essentially, they were aiming their aircraft along corridors which had been cleared 
for passage. The Germans had indicated they would not fire on the aircraft. Can you imagine flying at one or two or 300 feet and you see all those 88 gun barrels, 88 millimeter gun barrels pointed at you? Well, that's, that's what they talked about. It was like running the gauntlet, but the guns weren't shooting. They were waiting for the moment they would change their minds. But this changed the, the complete attitude of these, these guys who flew on this operation M, and, and in this Lancaster, M for Mabel. They had every right to leave the war behind and go home. They had finished their tours. They volunteered for this one. They knew how important it was. And Joe English, the man in the center, the pilot, said, the food packs that we dropped were the best kind of bombs we ever dropped. Joe lived to ripe old age in Calgary. And I shared that moment with him again when the book was published. And look in the bottom right-hand corner. On the second or third pass to Rotterdam and Utrecht, and Harlem and, and Amsterdam to drop the food on the soccer fields and the open fields, which were dry. The families had taken their best linen and curtains and spelled out on the ground, thank you boys for their effort in doing this, which for the Joe English crew was going way above and beyond. The climax of the war in the Netherlands, in many ways, was the signing of the surrender at a place called Wageningen. Close? Wageningen. On the 4th of May. Like the picture I showed you earlier of the woman with her hands in the air in Utrecht is the next day, once the Dutch learn of, of the signing and the surrender. Here's a little bit of film footage taken, I think, on the first anniversary, a year later, uh, on the, of the signing, a little bit of news footage. Uh, to show you what it looked like when they were celebrating the anniversary of the sign. Flash, Lieutenant General Folks and Prince Bernhardt arrive at Wageningen for a ceremony commemorating the German army's surrender in Holland. The Netherlands prince inspects the Guard of Honor, and thousands of Hollanders listen to addresses by the Canadian commander and their prince. Outside the building where the surrender conferences took place and the final agreement was signed by General Folks and General Blaskowitz, a plaque is unveiled. Presented to the town burgomaster, the plaque marks the historic spot where a once mighty Germany was forced to bow to superior allied might. Now, here's the surrender table. This is inside the Hotel de Welt, Hotel de Welt in um, Wachenhagen. And you see on the left-hand side, the Germans who are surrendering and the Canadians who are receiving the surrender. There are two really interesting stories associated with this moment. Both of them involve Canadians. First of all, how did General Johannes Blaskowitz get to this table? <laughs> well, he got there thanks to Don Kerr, who was a signaler in the Canadian Signal Corps, came ashore on Gold Beach on June the 6th, 1944, fought all the way through France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And on the 3rd of May, he's told to drive north to retrieve General Blaskowitz from some location on the northern edge of what was essentially Allied liberated Netherlands. And he knew that this was a risky job because maybe along the way, not everybody had agreed to the surrender. He jumps in a Jeep, takes off, goes down the road and literally turns to his sergeant, I guess, who was with him in the Jeep and said, we may never get out of this alive, but here we go. And they drove north to a, a place in, the, in, in northern, that northern sector. And they found this guy. Before they found Blaskovitz, they came around a bend and suddenly they're looking at the muzzle of a tiger tank. And, and Don turned to his buddy, the sergeant, and said, this may be it. You know, <laughs> it's been a pleasure knowing you. But they let them pass and then they got to Blaskovitz. When they confronted Blaskovitz and said, we're taking you to deliver the surrender. He said, not, with my, not, not without my entourage, we're not. He had an entourage of eight or 10 or a dozen people. Well, who was Don, a mere lieutenant to say no. So he brought them all along, knowing full well that the guys back in, in Wageningen would not be pleased. But he hauled them all there. And that's how Blaskovitz got there. Don Kerr, Canadian, went and retrieved him and brought him and his entourage to the surrender the next day at the hotel. The other Canadian story or Canadian character, let me go back to this shot. You see on the right-hand side, there's General Folks, uh, Brigadier George Kitching, 
uh, Prince Bernhardt. And between Folks and Bernhardt is a young man named George Molnar. George Molnar learned that morning, May the 5th, 1945, he was to go to the meeting. Why? He was the only man in the room who spoke both, both English and German, which meant that he would interpret all of the details of the surrender, all of the responses of the Germans, and all of the responses of the Canadians on the right-hand side of the table. He is the junior ranking officer in that entire bunch. And he took all of that information and passed it back and forth. It was a very tense moment. This is the surrender of the Germans in the Netherlands. This is the acceptance of the surrender. All the details are there. Essentially, they've been worked out for several days, but it all had to be officially done. It couldn't be done officially until George Molnar read out the details and translated them on the fly for both sides. A Canadian from Alberta did the interpreting that day. Bet you didn't get that in history class either. Great picture, great moment, great history. Some of the stories that I've gathered about the liberation of the Netherlands came to me by accident and kind of out of the blue. I was in the Netherlands in 2005, preparing for leading a tour there. And I went to the National Liberation Museum near Grosbeek. It's literally what, um, Consul General, perhaps two, three miles from uh, the cemetery, the Grosbeek Cemetery, the National Museum. It's now been completely refurbished. If you go there, it's a brand new museum. But at the time in 2005, it had former parachutes. Look at the picture. These are all parachutes. The silk has essentially been um, winterized to allow it to become a roof for the museum at the time. So doing my scouting trip for a tour that I was going to lead later, I, I led to um, the Netherlands that spring, 138 Canadians. <laughs> my wife just about divorced me for leading a tour that large. But that's how many people wanted to go. Anyway, I'm doing some scouting and I'm in the museum. And among the things in the museum then were cairns and flags and colors of all the regiments of all the allied nations that had helped to liberate that part of the Netherlands or virtually all of the Netherlands. And standing in front of one of the little cairns was this man on the left, Theo Diepenbrock. And I went up to him not sure what age he was, where he'd come from. And I introduced myself and not surprisingly, he spoke fluent English. And he told me, no, he had been born just before the war, but he hadn't been a veteran in it. And so he sat down and he told me his story. And here's a little bit of it. As Canadian signals, infantry, armored and artillery units gathered in the Grosbeek staging area, the troops learned even more about the kinds of conditions under which Dutch civilians had lived throughout the war. For more than five years, German forces had converted town halls to their army headquarters, transformed railway stations into munitions depots, changed chateaus into armed fortresses, and leveled whatever was left. In the Dutch countryside, particularly during their retreat eastward toward Germany, the Germans had confiscated all that was consumable and left residents to deal with the scorched earth that remained. Those were the conditions in which an artillery group found Theo Diepenbrock and his family in late January 1945. Down in the left-hand corner of this image, you'll see the small town of Moak. That's where Theo and his family lived. And you can see in this image, this is a military map indicating the massing forces preparing for Operation Veritable, the push, push into Germany in February of 1945. And this is where Theo meets these Canadians. Just 13 years old, Theo, with his 17 brothers and sisters, had scratched out a living on a farm throughout the Nazi occupation near Moke. But since potatoes and goat's milk were their only produce, by midwinter, Teo's parents worried there wouldn't be enough to feed so many mouths for very much longer. 
Then almost as quickly as the Germans had come in 1940, they disappeared. And a six-man gun crew from the 6th Field Regiment of the Royal Canadian Artillery had set up a gun position nearby. Naturally uninhibited, Theo Diepenbrock traveled to the Canadians' tents every day to make coffee, help them with their artillery gear, and make conversation. He befriended 24-year-old gunner J.J. Johnny Brook from Saskatchewan. Quote, it was cold and we needed boots for the winter, Tail remembered. Johnny Brook gave us food and clothing, chocolate for my family, end quote. Once during the stay in the Gross Bake area, the Canadian gunners took young Tail on a scavenging operation. In other words, when they had leave, as this operation was being prepared and they were ready to go, they took the time available to them to help the civilians there. Not a big surprise, knowing how many Canadians did this. The regiment set up a command post so that Bombardier Brook and his crew went out to gather wood and remnants of materials from the German occupation of the villages in the area to reinforce their dug-in position. They even found the front door and the wood stove from Theo Diepenbrock's former house in the debris and helped them set up a new place to live. Then, late in February, as the 6th Field Regiment moved eastward with Operation Veritable, a gun shell misfired in their artillery piece and Johnny Brook was killed. The young Dutch boy was devastated. When Brooke was buried on a hill in what would become the Canadian War Cemetery at Grosbeek, Theo Diepenbrock began a ritual he has maintained into his 70s, tending Canadian graves there. Theo said, Johnny was just 24 years old. They came from the middle of nowhere in Canada, just volunteers, and they kicked Hitler out of Holland. At least two or three times a week, Theo Diebenbrock would go to that grave site and others at Gross Bay, attend the grave, pay respects, lay flowers, and remember what the Canadians did to save the civilians, as well as to drive the Germans out of the Netherlands, what they did to help civilians survive. Theo, on the following visit, when I brought more Canadians, five years later, had taken over City Hall in the town where we went, just outside the Grosbeek Cemetery, and set, he was a singer. He was a, a troubadour. Are you familiar with him? He, was record, he recorded a number of his songs on, on CDs. Anyway, when we arrived in 2010, he had taken over this building. He had set up on a stage his music, his musical instruments. The town had prepared for us breads, meats, cheeses, wine for lunch, and he serenaded us while we were there as thank you for my connection with him as we remembered J.J. Johnny Brook and Theo Diepenbrook's 17 brothers and sisters who survived because of the Canadians' goodwill and generosity. As a final note, the eight-month campaign to liberate the Netherlands cost more than 67, 7,600 Canadian lives lost. So the next time someone talks about the liberation of the Netherlands, which the Dutch never forget, remind the Canadians who don't know as often or as well, or the Americans or the British or anybody else for that matter, that Canada was there. Canadians served in the liberation of that country and the Dutch never forget. Thank you very much, uh, Tad. Uh, before we take any questions, Ted would like to say, say to come, on. come on on camera. <laughs> <laughs> and you are for the benefit of those who don't uh, know. Paul Davis, RC my member. Yes. And uh, a great enthusiastic supporter of our library. Right. So um, Whenever I run into people who are searching like I have for all 19 of my books, context, background, 
regimental histories, mm -hmm. war diaries. The library in this building that was here, except for the years when they were building this condo above it, uh, was a sanctuary and a treasure trove and an inspiration whenever I came here. And so as a small thank you, a copy of Days of Victory, the current edition, back into the library in case the one that was there from 1995 is a little tattered <laughs> and overused. We can always use a new copy for sure. And uh, Penny Lippman would be so grateful for this. That's great. She's done a marvelous job during, uh, during the pandemic to keep the library together, you know, sir. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. And my Council General. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ted. As a member of the Library Committee, I can assure you the book will be in good company. Thank you. Hey, just a second, Pat. We have one more presentation. Oh. As you, as you said to the Council General, and he's here. Sir, I know that uh, you've only been here a brief period for four months, I think. Two months. Two months. And um, he is, uh, Council General uh, Adema is here for four years. And so um, uh, we have been spending the, the evening uh, going over some of your history, uh, talking a little bit about what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> but the discoveries of Dutch history in Canada that are important or will be clearly important to you and which we have lived with almost without even thinking. Uh, the homogeneousness of our society is that we have, have uh, or the diversity is we've incorporated so many wonderful cultures and the Dutch the, the ground literally on which we uh, have built our homes and you know, yielded great farm produce and so much else uh, in our country is thanks to uh, the Dutch who came here before the war and after the war. And that's part of your story. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Yes, so uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much for this book um, and for your story. It's, uh, you know, you're right. We learn in school about the, the, the Second World War history, but, uh, I, when I learned it, it was very, um, it's, it doesn't get all the, the personal and the, uh, the deep personal touch of it we, don't, we didn't get. So I feel this was my first real history lesson. It was so nice to hear someone else talk about my country. And when you mentioned Theo Diepenbrock, I thought I've heard that name before. So I, I took my phone out and actually Theo Diepenbrock, I knew, I knew, I thought it was a singer. And so when you said it was singing, yes, I knew it was right. So, uh, so that's very nice. And um, I really like it also due to that, uh, that you invited, the director invited me here today. Uh, I got a tour of the, um, of the, of the museum. Uh, so I'm very proud that I can be here. One thing I want to say um, about my mom, uh, when she talks about the war, she lived in the North. So there actually, uh, as you were saying, in the, in the West with all the big cities, uh, people were hungry. Where she lived, she said, you know, I never really knew, I, I didn't even notice much of the war. I said, I remember my, my dad bought a goat. And so we had a lot of goat milk during the war. And that was something that was really nice. That's something really useful for, for us at that time. And my dad said one time a, a plane uh, crashed, uh, a German plane crashed near their house. And, uh, and so he went there and took all the little little uh, glass uh, things off where we the speed of the of the play you see the instrument panel yeah he took all of that out because he really liked that so <laughs> those are those are the kind of stories i heard from my parents but it wasn't that bad also it was really nice uh, to you hearing your stories thank you very much thank you a pleasure and thank you for coming to me. back to you pat yeah i believe now it's a question and answer so uh, if anybody has any questions of ted now is your time. Uh, should I go to the chat line in case that's where they're coming yes. through? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, Ted, uh, my father was with the Algonquins uh, during uh, the, the liberation of Holland. <clears throat> and um, when, when he uh, rejoined the forces after uh, the Second World War, he thought he'd be assigned to Korea, and they sent him to uh, to Germany with NATO. And on one of his very first leaves, he wanted to go back to Holland to uh, thank the uh, woman with the windmill who had allowed him to set up his his company headquarters there. So it took him a while to figure out exactly where that windmill was, but finally he thought, "Gee whiz." With these these maps, uh, this is probably where it is. So he went to the windmill. It was on a Saturday, of course, and he was in his civilian clothes. So he knocked on the door, and um, 
eventually uh, the owner, the woman, uh, approached the door and he inst instantly recognized that it was her. A lot grayer, of course, but it was her. And she came to the door and she looked at him as if he was vermin. And of course, he was very embarrassed. And he said, uh, Madam, I'm uh, Major Stock. You were kind enough to allow me to use the windmill as my company headquarters. And I just wanted to come by and thank you again for your generosity. And then he watched her and he thought, oh my goodness, uh, too much time has passed and she doesn't remember. So then he became a little bit embarrassed because he realized he was imposing on her. And he said, Madam, I, I'm so sorry to bother you. Thank you very much. And he started to turn. And all of a sudden, he heard this great <laughs> intake of air. And the woman said, oh, yeah, I remember you, my ear stock, but you smell much better now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Yes. And it, it, I have a, a whole box full of stories much like that, where Canadians returned very sort of... Um, uh, gingerly to these places, unsure of what would happen. But remarkably, in many of the cases of the stories, the intersections of the town, streets, the, the buildings restored almost to the way they were. And then it was almost like stepping back into history for these Canadians to rediscover these moments. And it's like that too when you go to the cemeteries, because having gone with the cemeteries, at uh, Grosbeek and Bergen op Zoom, one of my dear friends, Robert Longworth, who is, I think, on Zoom with us tonight, lost his cousin in the campaign on the Scheldt. And remarkably, after a visit to Bergen op Zoom, um, he connected with a man who, like Theo Diepenbrock, attended JJ Johnny Brooks Memorial headstone. Uh, this man, Garrett had attended his cousin's headstone and a fast friendship began. So much so that Gert and his family came the year before the pandemic to visit Robert and Ev and his family and my wife and me in Toronto. That's how tight the bond is between the families that saw loved ones go to liberate Europe and in particular the Netherlands and the Dutch returning that favor, returning that love and affection and respect generation after generation after generation. We have to learn from the Dutch how to keep those memories alive. Any other questions? You're right, uh, Ted, and I'll say good night. But before I do, I would just like to express my deep conviction that you and your father are pillars of our national heritage. Oh, God thanks. bless you, and thank you very much. That's very kind. I appreciate that. There is one in the, uh, the uh, chat uh, section from Ted Rumble. Uh, is it true that the Canadians in the Scheldt had little air support? Um, that would be, as far as I know, would be true until they got to Valkyrie Island. Uh, because ultimately, when the Germans who had been backed into Valkyrie Island at the west end of the Scheldt, were standing their ground, and I emphasize ground, tenuously, tenuously, they uh, essentially took some of their own medicine back because it was decided that the dikes surrounding Valkyrie should be bombed and Valkyrie be flooded to drive the Germans out. So particularly, and this was in January, I believe, of 45, um, the, uh, the dikes were blown, Valkyrie Island uh, was flooded, a lot of civilian loss, but it drove the Germans off the island and the Canadians and the British and the Poles liberated the last stretch of the Scheldt on the North Shore, opening up the estuary to allow Antwerp to become the new operational springboard into the final stages of the war into Germany. Um, any more questions? Uh... Any from our, oh, sorry, we have a hand here in the, uh, in the live living audience. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, the Canadian Army also had an a, a, a input into the resupply of the Dutch uh, populace, I believe, at the end of the war. Right. Quest the, the comment is that the Canadians 
uh, participated in the resupply of the Dutch population at the end of the war. Yes. Provided uh, uh, supplies by truck to the German through the German lines to a supply depot behind German lines, not far behind. And then I believe then the Germans went and distributed it because most of the Operation Mana and what were in the big population areas up on the north coast, but the uh, rural areas down in the south near Wageningen and the Bergen op Zoom. Um, you know, needed food as well, and the Canadian Army provided that through um, service corps, which my father. Right. Started. Yeah. Very good point. Very good point. The this, the comment is that um, while the battles were being fought and lost uh, on both sides, supply was absolutely vital, which is why Antwerp was so important. Because as I said, up until Antwerp was secured. Supplies were still coming from France and Belgium and so on, some of the, the coastal ports, not Antwerp, which was larger. But without that key element, the supply function of, dri of drivers, of the motor pools, of the supply crews, the, the drivers, the, the, the guys who drove trucks full of gasoline to fuel the tanks and the aircraft and the, the trucks to keep the army moving. Nobody ever talks about that. Without supply, I mean, you know, literally, the, the stomach of the army, not just the food stomach, the stomach of its functioning on the ground relied entirely on the ability of the supply depot, the supply service to deliver. So your, as you say, your father was among them. Yeah, absolutely vital, but invisible and, and rarely talked about. But those, those spots uh, were just as perilous to defend and, and to service as anywhere else. Uh, your father deserves a lot of credit for doing that incredible work and nobody noticing. <laughs> I have a question from Vivian and Anthony Hopkins. Uh, Ted, Vivian McAllister here uh, on Zoom. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And I really enjoy the way you take history as really the, the importance of personal stories in history rather than the great movements of armies. I'll just tell you uh, that the collaboration between uh, the Netherlands and Canada continues all the way to today. I served several tours in Afghanistan with the medical service and the easiest allies that we had to work with were the Dutch, always uh, with the Dutch. Now with the uh, other forces, we were meant to be interoperable uh, and uh, share equipment and share uh, systems of uh, management and, and care, but for some reason it was always with the Dutch that we could blend the best. I don't know if any of my colleagues are online and will verify this. I don't know if it's uh, a consequence of the partnership that was, uh, that probably grew out of what you've described uh, there or not, or it's just that we had uh, similar principles and similar uh, understandings of the importance of various things. But that's a comment and I don't know what you think of it. I don't think I could say it any better, Vivian. You said it perfectly because that's, I'm sure is the case that much of our bond comes from that liberation period. And anyone who entered the armed services in Canada or those in the Netherlands would know their history enough to say this bond continues uh, and must be. Thank you, that's a great point. For our uh, Zoom audience, if you wish to, um, uh, for a question to have said, uh, please uh, enter it in the chat section. Maybe, um, yes. Maybe just one small comment I'd like to add. Come, come here because we can't hear you on the, the Zoom audience can't hear you unless you're in front of this microphone. The Consul General's back. <laughs> but very short, very short. What I wanted to say is that um, um, tomorrow, uh, I'll be at the Consulate General of Israel, where they will be handing out a, a special award to a Dutch family from Snippen, who actually had uh, Jewish people in their house. And this is a special, hidden, hidden. Yes. Yeah. 
So these people, they this is an award that the Israeli government, uh, together with another organization, hand out, um, not very not very frequently, and they do it. They give it to families who are not Jewish, uh, but who are helping Jewish families, and so that's something that's happening tomorrow. So it's great being here and hearing also what, and I've heard that before as well, the good uh, cooperation between the, the Canadian and the Dutch armies uh, now and in the past. And at the same time, also uh, other ways we can still commemorate this uh, this war and, and its uh, casualties, but also the, the heroes. There's so many heroes that, uh, that have been doing this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of, the, one of the things that I, I should pass along for those of you who might be on the cusp of thinking about going traveling again, if you decide to travel and it's around May, I strongly recommend that you go to the Netherlands and be there for May the 4th. May the 4th, and correct me if I'm wrong, Consul General, is the evening of the silent march, correct? Is it the 4th or the 5th? The fourth. This is, of course, the day on which the Germans officially surrender. When I was there with my 138 <laughs> uh, tour entourage in 2000 and whatever the heck it was, five or something, we were asked, we had at that point, we had 33 veterans with us. How things have changed on those tours. We had 33 veterans and about 100 civilians. And we arrived um, in a small town called Barn, south of Amsterdam. And we had been invited there to come and be part of the evening silent march. We thought, okay, well, go along. It must be some sort of symbolic representation of you know, uh, the period and rec recognition of, of, and remembrance. We arrived on three buses and the veterans were all herded to the very front of this parade. And everyone instructed not to say a word. And then the rest of us, 100 civilians from the other two buses, file in behind. Now in Barn, as in many communities, um, there is a central park in the middle of the town. I can't remember the name of the, of the park, doesn't matter. Um, and we begin to walk through the streets of Barn. No one speaks. But as we walk, houses, churches, apartment buildings, business buildings, city hall, begin to empty of all their civilians and they join this march. So what began with 33 veterans and 100 Canadians over a period of about a half an hour between 7.30 and eight o'clock in the evening, just as the sun is set, grows to a, a parade of probably five, six, 700 people. And all you hear are the, on the cobblestones as we're walking and the birds chirping. Birds. Just before eight o'clock after a serpentine parade through barn, arriving around the edge of this park, which is sheltered by trees so we can't see into the park. We're walking around the edge of the park and just at eight o'clock we arrive and every bell in that town begins to ring. The city hall bell, the church bells, school bell all begin to clang and the, no the birds flying. And just as that cacophony of noise from the bells comes to a conclusion, we come around the end of the row of trees and there were 5,000 civilians in the park waiting for us. I wept, the veterans wept. We couldn't believe that total strangers could be treated like this as we entered the park and then a big ceremony recognizing the civilian loss as well as the military loss on all sides. It was a remarkable expression of the bond that we were talking about tonight. And it continues every May 4th, if you're near any town or village or city in the Netherlands on the evening of the 4th, find the silent march, it will change you. Believe me. Uh, Ted, I believe we have another question from Anthony Hopkins. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, um, in addition to the airdrops, um, I think there were food convoys where Canadian troops delivered food driving past civil arms and active German soldiers. 
Yes, uh, we, well, we were alluding to it earlier with the service um, uh, core delivering food. And I, I have pictures of Canadian bakers doing nothing but baking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of loaves of white bread. And to the Dutch, it was like cake. They hadn't tasted real flour bread in five or six years. And for them, the delivery by means that you're describing and was described a moment ago by the service corps uh, was the difference between life and death or certainly survival. It's Brian Button here. Brian Button. Go Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Good to see you again, Ted. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Yeah, right. Uh, we're talking about uh, the um, the third div, which the Queen's Own went in into uh, in the Shelt area, and, uh, and uh, we lost a very we lost a, well, I guess we lost about forty there, roughly in that area that are buried in Armadin and in Belgium, and plus that Bergenhof Zoom. And I just recently, uh, a friend of mine from Holland contacted me about there's a movie called Out the Forgotten Battle. Have you heard about that one? I have. A lot of people have commented on it. Where is yeah, it? Yeah, I, I watched it. I watched it. And they mentioned the Canadians, but it doesn't say what regiments. But this, the Canadians went in over that in that area. Right. And, of course, you're a proud Queen's Own, so we have to make mention of them, right? Well, of course. <laughs> of course. When I see uh, I was supposed to go over last year, I was supposed to go over... Hopefully, we're going to go over in April. And you probably heard about the story about Jack Cavanaugh. Yes, but go ahead, uh, quickly. I've been there many a times in the little village of Raw. And uh, there was a fellow named Wim Felix who passed away this, this past year. But he was destined that that was uh, Jack Cavanaugh was buried in this little cemetery where it's near his home. And I remember going there uh, five years ago, and he was showing that. And it said, an unknown grave no name but they worked on it and they got the family involved now from belleville and uh hopefully next year we go over with a contingent from the regiment and uh we will do the proper ceremony there so that's the way the dutch people operate uh i've been over numerous of times i think i ran into you a couple of times i know in france we have and, and over in holland but uh, the dutch people will never forget uh I'm very fortunate enough, my grandfather uh, fought over there with the 48th Hounds. And I, I was over for the first time in 95 for the 50th. And the way they treat you over there was just amazed of being even a, a, you know, a grandson of a veteran. And I remember doing the, uh, the Groose, or the Groosby, or Groosby, going, going to the cemetery. But the big parade in Applebarn was just amazed. We were there for the uh, 50th in 95. And there we are, as you mentioned before, we go in a small contingent with our veterans. We had about 30 veterans and all of us, and the queen was there and we, the crowd was just unbelievable. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, out of this bar, a guy comes out with this tray of drinks. <laughs> you know, What do you do? You know, you think, okay, thank you very much. And we got flowers and everything else. So they'll never forget over at Holland. So that's right. And, and, and thanks to people such as yourself, Brian, for making sure that the message from Canada gets there every, every four or five years. Thank you. Yeah, right on. I appreciate it. You did a great job tonight. And I always enjoy your books too. I, I got numerous of them. Okay. Good thank stuff. You. Thank you for making sure that you were with us tonight. Um, right, thanks, Ted. Pleasure. Uh, Pat, did you want to wrap things up? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ted, uh, for really, well, all I can say is outstanding and very passionate presentation. Thank you very, very much. Most welcome. And, um, at this time, uh, you know, I usually give you a present, uh, thank you gift from RCMI, but I'm not there in person, so I'm going to call upon um, executive uh, assistant Susan Cook to do the honors. Susan, up in front. Uh. <laughs> yes. Ted, it's great to see you once again. And as always, a wonderful presentation. You bring everything to life for everyone. And we hope you come back again soon. And we'll have another. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Susan. Okay. Thanks, Pat. I have a few words to say myself. Next year will mark my 20th year organizing Military History Night. Oh, so. It was so temporary 
I remember Colonel Ed Raymond approaching me in the long bar at the old building and asking me if I would fill in for a couple of presentations until a permanent organization could be made. Well, take my surprise and on the spur of the moment, I accepted. March 6, 2002, and the topic, Field Kit, 1939 to 45, comparison of German and Canadian equipment. The speaker at that time was Bob Grieve with another gentleman, and it was held in the K. Christie room of the old building. Since that time, Military History Night presentations have seen many changes and have covered many topics. And just to mention a very few, and there were many, I'm going to read a few of them out to you. First hand accounts include Jean de Vries, a Dutch born Canadian paratrooper with the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion who parachuted into Normandy on D Day. A and Joanne is with us tonight, his wife. Yes, I know, Joanne. She's very, yes, I, I knew Jan very well myself. World War II U-boat, Unit 190 engineer, Werner Hirschman. George MacDonald, a prisoner of war of the Japanese. And as you mentioned before, former RCMI President Charles Scott Brown, Ken Lone, who uh, parachuted onto Sword Beach. Jim Lutz, a Vietnam vet. Dr. Ken Hedges, a medical officer on the British Transarctic Expedition, 1968-69, uh, which was entered into the Guinness Book of Records. This is only a, a small sampling. Bob Farkerson, a pilot in Burma who donated the Burma Star pendant to RCMI. Ed Mackay, a typhoon pilot with a 438 squadron who could fly a plane but could not drive a car. <laughs> Henry Van Tack, a teenage uh, Dutch resistance fighter, a true um, unsung hero and a very good friend of mine. Child, uh, British child evacuees with Patrick and Tessa Murphy. I covered many topics. Uh, British um, Korean and Vietnam vet Mort Lightstone. Fraser McKee from Naval. A World War II Canadian military nurse. A British war bride. Now Charlie Fox. He was a World War II pilot. He spoke twice. Uh, in 1944, his uh, plane stri strife the uh, car of Field Marshal uh, Erwin Rommel, uh, severely um, injuring the German uh, Desert Fox. Charlie Mann of the combined US-Canadian First Special Services, also known as the Devil's Brigade or the Black Devils. And who could forget the Jenny Wren's musical review with Margaret Halliburton and members of World War II oh. Friends, last military history night presenters at the old building. Now, other presentations included Fred Mattish, History of the Dam Busters, The Bouncing Bomb, Eric Morse, Roman Empire, Prince Alexis Trubotskoy, The Russian Revolution, Dominic Levin, Professor of Russian and International History at Cambridge University. Alan Bell, members of an SAS member. Lincoln Assassination with Kieran McCullough. And RCMI's very own esteemed member, Dr. Charles Godfrey, a World War II Air Force, who along with myself organized historical plays with RCMI members, and we were known as the RCMI Thespians. Now, a few um, semi-military topics included Toronto historian uh, Mike Filey's presentation of the terrible tragedy and great loss of life when the cruise ship Neuronic burned in the Toronto Harbor in 1949, Hurricane Hazel in the 1950s, uh, which devastated large parts of Toronto with speaker Steve, Steve Pitt. Now, that's just a small sampling, 20 years I was supposed to do two presentations and I do two, I did two decades so far. Anyway, uh, that being said, I'm moving forward. The next History Night is scheduled for Wednesday, January the 13th, 2022. And our speaker for that evening will be RCMI Director and Secretary Jim Lutz. Topic, Queen Victoria's Army, 1939-45. 
the finest expeditionary force in history. I invite you all to attend for what I know will be a very interesting presentation. And at this time, I would like to thank the RCMI behind the scenes team for their strong support and expertise without which this presentation would not happen. And thank you, host, uh, Zoom host Marguerite, and also Eric Morse, who along with his many other RCMI responsibilities, produces the RCMI videos. So ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Thank you for your participation. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again and uh, a safe journey home to our uh, live audience. And uh, I now declare this uh, meeting ended. Good night all. Good night, Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.